and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor once again to welcome all of you into the Puritan Barn for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, we're going to be taking a look at biblical prophecy. We're going to be looking at biblical prophetic texts that I believe have been ignored, that are right there in the Word of God. So it's going to be an awesome show. So get ready. It all starts right now because we are now live. What's up, guys? Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. and got it glitched out for just a second on the audio. So hopefully you guys picked it up what I was saying there. It was really weird. Uh, but anyways, um, I hope you guys are doing good. What a blessing to be here tonight and, and just mm -hmm. to see all of you guys in the chat that are here in the chat. And I know in the future all the comments that are going to be on here and just to let you know, we do read comments for about the first couple hours that the video is out there. Uh, after that, they get so many we, we can't catch up. But we love to see where you guys are from. I'd love to see that in the chat and also on the comments. See, tell us where you guys are from. Uh, we, we Like I said, we love to see people all around the world that are trying to follow the way the best that they can. So with that being said, David, how are you doing? Fantastic. And, you know, I think it's very true to say that whether people are in Australia or in Europe or in Africa or South America, there's a common situation that this is a global takeover. It's a global persecution. We're in the planned destruction of our nation mm -hmm. and of all sovereign nations for the one world order the Bible talks about. So I know that our listeners from all over the world, they can relate because they're in a common situation. Yeah, I mean, everybody's in the same. This is not just a localized thing like in the past you know usually you have a localized kind of thing this is an, an agenda that's reaching worldwide we saw it happen in 2020 and it's just getting worse and like david said all of this is planned in order to bring on what's new because in order to bring on what's new the old way has to be completely destroyed and and so this is going to be cool i know that this this uh subject right here is not a it's not a really a popular idea in fact, you know, people it scares people a lot, and, and and also you can see on Facebook lately the fact checkers. If you post anything about upcoming famine or anything, they have a thing that says it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll happen in the U.S. This is their fact check thing that they're doing. So this topic's not going to be a popular one. They don't want people knowing what's coming. I don't. I don't assume that they want people knowing what's coming. But even if it, even if even if the famine doesn't happen this year, next year, whenever, there's bound to be that happening one of these days. But there is a prophecy that talks about that. David's going to discuss it with us. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors. Um, I have to say, we have this uh, soap called the Midnight Ride Soap. And uh, the carriers of that are Sugar and Spice Soap Company, and their link are in the description. So it's a Midnight Ride Soap. It's awesome. Check it out. Also, we want to give a shout out to um, uh, I guess, well, Joshua Watts, I was going to say Joshua Watts, but Joshua Watts isn't taking any orders till this fall. So we want to give a shout out to nystv.org. You can use the coupon code writer for your first month free. We have documentaries. We have, um, our book of Enoch video commentary, which we just recorded a new one the other day, which will be up this week. Uh, a lot of stuff going on on there. All of our stuff that's been banned from YouTube stuff that's too hot for YouTube that we can't even talk about on YouTube is on there so make sure you guys give that a check out and see if you like it and if you if you don't like it cancel the next month it, it, it you know we just want everybody to get the opportunity to check it out at least and see what they think with that being said david 
let's get on with the ride. All right. Uh, seven prophesied years of famine. And I know that our listening audience is a very intelligent listening audience. And I know that you've all heard the things just from the talking heads, the economists and uh, the people that study such things, the food shortages, the potential for famine. It's being talked about quite a bit lately. And the important thing is what does the Word of God say? And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. We're going to be looking at prophetic scriptures about seven years of famine. Now let's begin in the book of Genesis, chapter 51. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath shewed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years. And the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that come up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, which God is about to do. He sheweth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. And it's interesting that it was from the blast of the east wind that this famine came on. And the interesting thing about this famine, which was for seven years in Egypt, God used this famine for delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt back into the promised land. So this famine had very good results ultimately for the children of God. God has a big plan and uh, we need to keep that in mind. In Amos 3 and 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto the prophets. This did not take God's people by surprise. Joseph was warned by the Lord. They prepared, and God's remnant was prepared, and they came out victorious. And this is something that uh, the Lord will always do. God's people that are walking in obedience and seeking his face are not going to be taken by surprise. Now, we have a seven-year period of famine recorded in Scripture that took place in Egypt, and we have another one. Let's look at this one. In 2 Kings chapter 8 and 1, Then spake Elisha unto the woman, whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou in thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. So we have a seven-year period of famine in Egypt. We have one here in the days of Elisha, a seven-year famine. And you notice here that the Lord called for the famine. This famine was the Lord's instigation. And both of these famines were used in a way that the prepared remnant of God were blessed by it. Now, there's a very little a very important little piece of information here from John Gill's commentary on 2 Kings 8 and 1, and this is the little dot connector that we're going to use to unpack this as a prophetic event. The, the incident of seven years' famine in Egypt, the one in 2 Kings 8 and 1, these are not just isolated instances, but they are a pattern of judgment that the Father uses, and we're going to see that this pattern is going to come back. And I personally believe that we are on the very cusp of this seven-year prophetic period of famine. Now, John Gill, in his commentary, said this, The Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years, which Jarchai says was the famine that was in the days of Joel. It was undoubtedly on account of the idolatry of Israel and was double the time of that in the days of Elijah. So understanding that the prophecy 
of the seven-year famine in 2 Kings 8 and 1 was the one spoken of by the prophet Joel. This gives us our paradigm to understand that these seven-year prophetic periods of famine, they're not isolated, but they're definitely cycles of judgment on the, from the Father because of idolatry and disobedience. Now let's go to the book of Joel. The book of Joel, chapter 1, and verse 4, and they got bugs. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left the caterpillar eaten. And there were four different insects here that carried about and instigated a tremendous famine in the land of Israel. Now, in verses 15 through 18 of chapter 1, it says here, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under their clods. This is crop failure. This is massive crop failure. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beast groan? The crop failure and the groaning of the beast, this is very reminiscent of the same famine that was in the days of Pharaoh where they had the seven lean cattle that were lean and suffering. The beast were groaning. There was crop failure. The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. The situation was brought about by the judgment of God that there was crop failure and massive crop failure over a large area that produced famine. And this famine was instigated by God as a judgment because of idolatry. And this is something that the same was true in the days of Joel. There was a righteous remnant walking in obedience that was not taken by surprise. The Lord will do nothing except he reveal it to his servants, the prophets. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. This is, I believe, the message now from anyone that would call themselves a true watchman of God. The judgment of God is snipping at the heels of this ungodly country. The things that come out each and every day get crazier and crazier. It's time to blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm that the judgment of God is soon to come, and we must be ready spiritually and physically for that which is coming. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now we've got the bugs. Joel 1 and 4 said there's four bugs, but we got more. And in the days of Joel, it was the Chaldeans that came in. Now we have, look at the way the Word of God phrases this, upon the mountains, spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. There hadn't there have been a lot of armies, a lot of wars, but this is a little different. Hasn't never been anything like this army. And it spread upon the mountains of Israel there. Now, I believe this is exactly what it is, and as we go deeper into this text and into the prophetic scriptures, we're going to connect it in many different directions. But that which the prophet Joel saw, and he prophesied of this people that there's never been an army like this before spread upon the mountains. And I believe that this is the very thing that is prophesied in Isaiah 13, 1 through 3, the vision which Isaiah, son of Amos, saw against Babylon, lift up a standard on the mountain of the plain, exalt the voice to them that beckon with the hand, Open the gates, ye rulers. I give command, and I will bring them 
Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath, rejoicing at the same time and insulting. And the standard is lifted up on the mountain here in this prophetic text in Isaiah. And I read it from the Septuagint because I like to use it as a commentary. It really captures the heart of just what's going on there. And these giants upon the mountains prophesied by Isaiah, these are the same that were saw by Joel. He saw this army. There's never been an army like this. It's on the mountains of Israel, and it's coinciding with this famine and this period of famine. And uh, this is this amazing army. And we're going to learn more about it as we go deeper into this text. Now, in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, a fire devoureth before them, and this is talking about this army, and behind them a flame burneth, the land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. These entities are specifically destroying fertile cropland. They're making land that is uh, abundant for crops. They're desolating it and making it unusable. In verse 4, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Now, this is the first point of prophetic similarity where we're going to connect the seven-year famine in the period of Joel, which was the same we saw in 2 Kings 8 and 1, that this is going to be repeated. And here we see this army that Joel described. They're on the mountains. They're spread upon the mountains. I believe the same is in prophesied in Isaiah. These giants that come out from the gates to the tops of the mountains. And we're going to see prophetically in the book of Revelation We've seen this before, and we'll look here in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, when the abyss is open, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth, and uh, unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. When the abyss is opened, there are scorpions going to come out. But these scorpions, they're not just normal scorpions. These are what I believe we could call hybrid entities. They are hybrid entities, and they are the departed spirits of hybrid entities that are going to come out of the abyss when the restrainer is removed and the abyss was open. So we got locusts. The book of Joel talks about locusts, and in Revelation 9 and 7, it gets even more specific and the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And these entities, and this is also often referred to as Joel's army, and in the New Apostolic Reformation, they say that they're Joel's army. And Paul Wilbur wrote the song about Joel's army, and they sing the song about Joel's army, and they're the New Apostolic Reformation, and they're going to do this and that. Well, I'm just happy about their little selves. But this army prophesied in the book of Joel, this is from the pit of hell, and it's going to come with the judgment of God. And the locust. They're like horses, and there are so many points of comparison that you cannot deny that the return of Joel's army, this is exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 9 when the abyss is going to be opened up. Joel chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. You have something you want to say, John? No, no, go ahead, David. All right. Joel chapter 2, verse 5 through 7. We'll get even more definitive here. And in Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains shall they leap. 
like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, the stubble, a strong people set in battle array. Before their faces the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. Now here is another important point here in Joel's prophecy. That word mighty is the Hebrew word 1368. That is the word Giborim. This army that was upon the top of the mountains, they are Giborim. And we're going to be even more specific, but we're, and we're going to show unequivocally that these Giborim are Giborim that will be released from the heart of the earth. Uh, John and I were talking just before uh, the show. He was showing me some clips of strange sounds going on in the in, in the Evansville area, wasn't it, John? Yeah. Where they're hearing strange sounds like explosions and noises, and there's no explanation for it. Well, I believe the explanation for it is these things are taking place under ground. I know there's things going on under the ground in Evansville, Indiana, in a lot of places, and this is indeed Joel's army getting ready to do a little shaking into bacon. I believe it with all my heart. Now, going on in the text, it says, like mighty men, they shall climb the walls like men of war, and they shall mark, march everyone on his ways and they shall not break their ranks. Now, what a gibberim is, the, the first use of the word gibberim in uh, the Bible is in Genesis, and it was mentioned here in chapter 10, the first mention of it after the sixth chapter of Genesis. And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And that word mighty is the same word gibberim, that was used to describe Joel's army in Joel chapter 2. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So we're going to see here that this army that's going to be released, they are going to be a Gibberim army, quite literally, from the bowels of hell. Now, in Joel chapter 2 and verse 8, it tells us something else about Joel's army here. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they shall fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Now, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? We've got an army here, an army of this Gibberim, and they're not even going to be injured if they're struck with the sword. The reason why? They're already dead. These are the dead, the Rephaim, that are going to come from the heart of the earth, and we, we're going to be able to get very specific with this to show you just exactly um, who's coming back and why, and the entire purpose, and the, the coming forth of Joel's army, that this is going to be connected here with these seven years of famine. Now, it talks here in the book of Joel, and it prophesied in Scripture about an army that literally, they're giants, they're the gibberim, and they cannot even be wounded with the sword. Now, talk about predictive programming. One of the most popular TV shows in the past few years has been The Walking Dead. Mm. And how many zombie shows have we had? I mean, mm. do we have enough fingers and toes on all <laughs> of us to count the zombie movies, zombie shows? Zombie, zombie, zombie. People are zombie crazy. Mm. And this is predictive programming to the max. And this is exactly what the Word of God says, that these gibberims are going to come back, and you try to kill them with the sword, you know, lots of luck, it ain't going to work they're already dead. Yeah, there, it reminds me too, in the Lord of the Rings, there's this army of the dead that comes back to fight with the with the characters or whatever over this ogre army of sorts. I don't know if they're called ogres. I can't remember what they're called, but they have like a, they're like a mixture of these, like basically huge Nephilim 
and it's pretty interesting but you're right it's in everything and then this all the marvel stuff is kind of pointing towards a return of some kind of super bean or whatever that we're gonna have to fight you know and all of these different things so this is this is interesting and what you said too about all these charismatic groups you know identifying with joel's army uh todd bentley i remember like in 2008 there was like a large cult following of that you know yeah so. and calling it a cult yeah that's that's appropriate i mean those people they don't have a clue yeah they don't have a clue of the judgment of god that's right upon them and I I feel very sorry for anybody that is deceived and hooked up with that mess. It's just that it's an absolute mess. Well, and the woman, uh, what was that show? The woman rode the dragon in. So popular. Uh, Game of Game, Game of, of Thrones. Yeah, Game yeah. Of Thrones, and yeah. the same thing. They had that army of the dead from the north. Yeah, the and, White Walkers. Uh, yeah, yeah. And this is it. it. This is Joel's army. And you want to get a? I mean, this is it. It's predictive programming. The Bible says there's never been nothing like it. They're gibbering, sticking with the sword. Ain't gonna hurt because these are already dead. This is literally the what the all the predictive programming of all the zombie stuff is about. It's the return of Joel's army. And uh, quite literally, it is the night of the living dead. And it's going to be hell for those that don't know the Lord. It certainly will be. Now, in Joel chapter 2 and verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. These entities are going to target the cities. How many times and for many years now we've been telling people, Get out of the cities for obvious reasons. And here's just another one to add to your list. These entities in Joel's army, they are going to target the cities. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. In verse 10, the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now in verse 10 here, we have timing. This gives us a scripture that we can connect with other scripture to give us a timing when the final fulfillment of Joel's army is going to take place. And we see that right in the doctrine of Christ in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So Joel connects this with the, the sun and the moon being darkened so we can see here from scripture that this final fulfillment of joel's army it will be right up into the time of the return of the lord so we could pretty much conclude that this seven-year famine it's going to culminate and conclude right before the return of the lord so we have here not just one event in egypt and another one in Israel in the days of Elisha, but we have cycles of judgment. The same famine in the days of Elisha is described here in Joel, and Joel prophesies that there will be one more ride of Joel's army that's going to come out of the abyss. It's going to be the judgment of God, and just like Joel said, there's never been anything like this. There's never been anything like this. And all of the predictive programming that we see uh, about the zombies, it's going to be literally the night of the living dead. This, this is such a good timely message, too, because I know there's a lot of people in the world that are so brainwashed right now. All they th can think about is whatever the agenda may be, whether it's COVID where the agenda was there, the vaccine or it was or the agenda is now you know let's let's stand with ukraine as if standing you know as if uh there aren't people in, and you know it's just weird how people they get on these kicks with whatever the news wants them to be excited about or or sad about or mad about but in all reality they don't even know the situation but these things right here 
this is biblical things that we can see happening right in front of our face and they're very timely so i you know it's it's amazing to me the the desire for people to latch on to things it's like joel's army for instance they'll latch on to anything yeah. that's not true yeah. as long as it strokes their ego in some way or as long as the media has brought it up and put it in front of their face uh, so yeah. you know timely message for sure well, i tell you what let's do mm -hmm. let's get all mad and let's send another fifty billion dollars to Ukraine yeah. so we can feel better. When we're in debt and yep. debt, and we have a negative interest rate, which <laughs> means that if you loan the U.S. money, yeah. you you they <laughs> promise you that they will pay you less than what you loan them. That's how that's how bad we are. But we're going to send off money to other people. It's ridiculous. Let's let's print them up fifty billion. Tell them to spend it fast while yeah. it's still worth something. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Joel chapter two verse eleven, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great for he is strong that executeth his word for the day of the lord is great and very terrible and who can abide it now this is the text right here to say that joel's army is god's army it's a good thing we're joel's army you know okay. uh, uh, we're gonna march and take over the world for jesus well probably not but there's a comment here by john wesley and he nails it on the head, as he did so many things. But this is John Wesley's notes on the Old Testament. And he had this very timely comment on Joel uh, chapter 2 here. And I think it was, yeah, verse 11. And it says this, Summon them and encourage them as a general doth his soldiers, his army, the locust and insects and of Chaldeans signified by these. So in the book of Joel, the locust, the, the other bugs, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, this is the army of God because God is using them for an instrument of judgment against his idolatrous people. Now, some people just can't get that. And there are people that want to argue and they want to argue on the basis of this verse that Joel's army is a good thing. Well, I just really seriously feel sorry for you. You're totally missing what's coming. And you have to understand that God is the instrument of judgment. He will use ungodly nations as instruments of judgment. He did it with Babylon upon Israel. He's done it with the Assyrian. He has done it over and over and over. And it's impossible when you study this entire chapter in context and you cross-reference it with the book of Revelation to come up with any other conclusion but that this is the army of hell. And we're going to be getting so much more definitive of uh, than that with just exactly what and who and where we're going to be dealing with here. Now, in Ezekiel 39 and 6, and I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked a lot about Magog, haven't we? We've got, we're going to show again a map at the end of this broadcast that shows the area of Magag, Magag, that's probably appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Magog, Mashish, and Tubal. And we're going to show you it's right around the Black Sea, right where the, the siege of Mariupol is taking place, right where Odessa is, right there where it's happening right now. Now, I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the aisles. Now, I wonder who those folks are. Hmm. Now, hmm. let's have a little comment here from Albert Barnes in his commentary. And he says, the judgment is extended to the isles or seacoast to shew that it should not fall only on Gog and his land, but on those who share Gog's feelings of hatred and opposition to the kingdom of God. Now, I wonder where you would go to find a nation that hates true Christianity any more than ours. And this word that is translated there uh, in the isles, it can mean island or it can mean seacoast. Mm. Now, I wonder where 
the most evil part of America mm -hmm. is. I tell you, it's a it's a marvel to me that the West Coast hasn't slid right off into the ocean already. Yeah. And you look at the East Coast. This is Washington, D.C., the biggest phallic symbol in the world. It's New York City, the, the United Nations, the goddess in the harbor. The seacoast of America are the most wicked, ungodly places on earth. Yeah, that's where all the merchants congregate. They bring in yeah. the goods and back and forth. And we know Tyre was one of those merchant nations, the Phoenicians, all of these different things. So it makes so much sense. And you're right. Where's the epitome of evil, evil in our in our country? It's always along the, the coast. And the only thing that amazes me about this is mm -hmm. that it, it hasn't hit already. I mean, it is the Lord is long suffering. Uh, he really is. But I tell you what, uh, time is growing short. And I think the, the remnant of God, the spirit of God is speaking that to many, many people's hearts. Now, let's look at another text here. Let's look at a text in Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 9. And a conclusion that I've come to, I've been studying a lot into Gog and Magog here lately, and I've come to a real conclusion that Gog and Magog isn't just one battle, it's a war. Mm. It's a war that has probably already started. Yeah. This war uh, in Russia and Ukraine is probably the start of the Gog Magog war. And there, there are things, and you know, I've studied this thing for years and I've tried to, there are things in here that just seem contradictory. And I've come to the conclusion that it's not just a battle, it's a war. And I'm going to be nailing more things down about that very soon. But here's, here's another text right here. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. Now, if they're going to burn them with fire seven years, this happens to happen at least seven years before the Lord returns. That's yeah. just uh, logical thinking. Yeah. And this coincides, I believe, we see these coincidences in the book of Joel, the seven years of famine. It's connected with that army of Gibberim on the mountains. Isaiah said they're coming out of the gates. The book of Revelation says they're, they're coming out of the pits, these Gibberim. And Ezekiel's going to nail it. He's going to name names. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. going to name names. But we see this. So we, we're going to have a period of time. And before the reign of the beast is totally implemented, there is going to be a time of famine that is going to be the worst that we've ever seen. It's going to be the, the fulfillment of Joel's army, and we're going to see what's going to happen to them little rascals when Joel's army is released. Now, let's look at um, here in Ezekiel 39, 11 through 15. And it shall come to pass in that day, and it talks about the Lord intervening and slaying this Gibberim Nephilim army. And it says, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of the graves in Israel, in the valley of the passengers of the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noises, the, the noises, the noses of the passengers, and there shall they bury Gog and his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamon Gog. Now, this word in the Hebrew, we're going to look at that, and we're going to see that this word passenger and the valley of the passengers, that this is literally speaking of the Rephaim and the dead that have crossed over. We're going to show that linguistically. In, in, in verse 12, and seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing of them that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be unto them a renowned the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth, to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search, 
And the passengers that pass through the land, when any seeth the man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it, till the barriers have buried in the valley of Hamon Gog. Now, I want to read from Daniel Block's commentary, and he's just all over this. He just really, uh, in my opinion, he's got it nailed. And uh, this is what uh, Daniel Block says in his commentary. He says, however, it seems best to treat ha Oberim as a designation for those who have passed on. That is, deceased heroes referred to elsewhere as the Rephaim. And that's exactly who these passengers are. They're the dead. They're the Rephaim. The reason why you can't kill them, they're already dead. He goes on to say, because of its new usage, the site will receive a new name, Gihimon Gog, the Valley of Hamon Gog, which appears to be a play on Gihinam, the Valley of Hinnom. Either this earlier, this was the site of Moloch worship and child sacrifice. Very appropriate that he would slaughter this army of the dead where they were worshipped with child sacrifice. And the very place of Gehenom, this is the word that Jesus used as the final lake of fire, Gehenna. Mm. Going on, he says, Brother Block says in his commentary, Ezekiel returns to his play on a bar to pass through. The inspectors referred to as Oberim, those who pass through, were to see to the burial of the Ha Oberim, though who's ha those who have passed on, the deceased heroes. Accompanying the inspectors would be another group, barriers, sextons, charged with the responsibility of disposing and discovering the remains. And the thing that is obviously to conclude is that there are time periods given, seven years and seven months, and these things, I believe, are going to preclude the beast kingdom because there's going to have to be some time for these things to be fulfilled. Hmm. So these things could be right, I mean, just right in our stuff here. And... Um, I was just looking, David, while you're looking that up, I was just looking at all the murals at Denver International Airport that I've seen in person before, and they took some of them down. But, man, these things are lining out, you know, exactly what we're talking about here tonight. You see the – you see – so you have this dark person, that the dark thing that looks like he's got a gas mask on and all of that coming oh, with yeah. a sword, killing a lot of people. You have this mass extinction thing, and then you have this – um, this mural that I'm looking at right now that you guys mm, probably can't see. I might be able to pull it up real, real quick for you guys. Cause I think that if you haven't seen it, um, it's not a bad thing to see. Here we go. So this is the mural where they're beating their swords into plowshares. You see this sword, they're beating it and you can, I, you, you know what a plowshare is when you see one, cause of those of you ever use one but they're literally taking their weapons. Look, see, they have all these weapons. This one represents the United States. It's got the United States flag wrapped in a bunch of weapons. It's got Bert right bitten on this side, United States wrapped in a bunch of weapons. And then you have this little blonde headed kid that looks like, uh, it's one of Trump's kids or something beating a plowshare right here, uh, with all of these things. And you've got all this, uh, all the countries, they have their swords. They're bringing them to a certain destination to beat them into plowshares. I wonder if that scripture uh, ties into that one in Jerusalem where they're going to be getting rid of their weapons for seven years. It very well could. And another uh, text, I don't have it here, but when it says Gog comes in, he comes against cities of unwalled villages. Mm. They're not defended. Yeah. Now, what would cause Israel? Is Israel ever going to say, okay, we're going to disband our armies. We're going to get rid of our nuclear weapons. The only thing that would cause that is massive military defeat. Yeah. We've talked about that many times in Isaiah 17. Yeah. Damascus will go away from being a city. Massive damage to Israel. Yeah. That is the only thing. And that's another point of timing. Yeah. This release of the Gibberim army, the war 
there in the Middle East, World War III, if you will, which is the, the Gog Magog War, all of these, and what's going to happen? There's going to be such horrific events that people and nations will disarm themselves for yeah. the beast and the false prophet to save them. Yeah. And uh, this is what it's going to take, and that's what it's going to happen. So that is amazing. Yeah. And uh, who, you know. Well, gosh. I mean, Denver Airport's just, I mean, they got tunnels. On, they got this huge underground bunker military tunnel looking thing, and they got all kinds of stuff going on this place. I mean, these murals were actually, uh, the free, there's a, every one of the murals that I saw when I went there, when, when they still had most of these murals, there was a big block in the front, and it was dedicated by the Freemasons. Yeah. each one of these things so how many whistleblowers and reports have there been of underground activity there in denver yeah it's huge yeah it's huge yeah and a lot of it not that far away are known underground military installations yeah so, yeah it's uh it's uh it's right upon us i believe it is now i want to look at this word a bar and this is uh 56 5674 is the Strong's number in the Hebrew. And I want to look at this in the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, which is the top of the food chain for understanding Hebrew words. It gives the etymology in all of the ancient languages. And it talks about how it's used in the Egyptian text and also how it's used in the uh, Sumerian uh, text of Rosh Hashemara. And this is amazing. And in the Egyptian text, the root that this word comes from, it says, uh, it says the uh, 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 most of the occurrences are found in the so-called books of the underworld, mortuary literature, book of the gates, litany of the sun, which guided the deceased to his or her goal of becoming one with Osiris. Huh. Now, this is something I saw this as a kid when I watched Boris Karloff and the Mummy. It says the the cyclical nocturnal course of the sun god is significant for the bodies of the deceased and for all the creatures of the underworld. When the light of the shining sun reaches the rigid mummies in their crypts, they are awakened and filled with breath. Wow. <laughs> I mean, well, this that's is what, what, what they've been trying for, right? I mean, yeah. That's what, yeah. Yeah. And this, this word in uh, the root of this word in Egyptian, Sumerian, take your pick. It, it's about bringing the dead back to life. Literally, bringing the dead from their realm of existence into this. And we're gonna we're going to explain why. We're not talking about dead human beings here, but we're talking about the dead, the Rafa, the Rafaim. Uh, David, an article real quick that just talks about your point here. I just want to show you guys this. This is really interesting here. Well, maybe if I can pull it up. So this is an article, and I remember this from 2021, but Russia Defense Minister announces plan to resurrect a 3,000-year-old Scythian army through cloning. Now, yeah. if that doesn't strike you as, you know, the Scythians were big. You see these bones here. The Scythians were a giant group of people that were strong and mighty. <laughs> yeah, the Scythians, according to Josephus, this was Magog. Yeah. You can get that right. Yeah. That is Magog right Isn't there. Isn't that crazy? Oh, my goodness. That yeah. is off the hook crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, what can you say? I mean, <laughs> wow. And in the ancient Sumerian kings, there were certain feast days where they actually claimed that they were able to bring back these dead kings for a banquet. Mm. Fairy tales, maybe. Uh, dark spirituality quite likely yeah. but somebody's taking this serious you yeah. know the russians uh and you know we did the show where we showed the russian perspective on uh on gog and magog they say, oh yeah we're gog yeah. oh yeah yeah that's us don't you dare say we're not gog yeah, yeah. they know exactly who they are yeah yeah even, if, even if other people don't want to admit it they know who they are and and in anybody that can study like we're studying right now can see that and it's pretty pretty amazing to see it playing out in front of our face man i mean wow yeah and, and this book gives the Canaanite, the Ugarit. I'll just give us a Canaanite reference All right. of this root. It means to bring over in the sense of lead or guide a corpse over. Mm. 
there's no doubt what this word means. Yeah. And there's no doubt what this valley of the passengers is. These are people that are coming over from the realm of the dead. It's Joel's army. It's just like Isaiah prophesied. Bring forth out of the gates on the tops of the mountains. It's identified and located there. It's pictured. And uh, I, I think they're going to be upon the mountains very, very soon. Hmm. Now, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 32, and we're going to get very specific. And uh, the Father's going to name names here. Now, in Ezekiel 32 and 18, Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her and the, note this phrase, the daughters of of the famous nations under the nether parts of the earth with them that go down into the pit. Now, I've, all, I've often thought, as many of us have, about the daughters that mated with the sons of God. Some of them were raped and uh, taken, and the Lord will not hold them accountable. But there were some that did it willingly. There were some that did it willingly. And here, and I believe, and this is just my idea, that, you know, a, a, a human woman is only capable of birthing so big a child where it's going to kill her. Yeah. And I believe that these women willingly underwent genetic manipulation to be able to birth these. Yeah. And uh, it just makes sense. I can't prove it, but it just makes sense. But here in the Word of God, we see specific judgment for the daughters of the famous. And this is an obvious allusion back to Genesis 6 of the daughters of the heroes of old. And it says, Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her and the daughters of the famous nations unto the nether parts of the earth with them that go down into the pit. And in this judgment oracle against Egypt, we see the Nephilim leaders. And Egypt was one of the worst of incorporating the worship of the Nephilim, and they are going to be sent down into the nether parts of the earth. Now, let's just read this text. Some of our dear listeners might not be familiar with it, but these are the daughters it's talking about, the daughters of the famous nations, of the heroes of old, the Gibberim. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days. That word is Nephilim. After the flood, they were called the Rephaim. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. They were the mighty men, and there's our word again there, Gibberim. This is the mighty men of the army of Joel's army. The Gibberim spread upon the mountain. Never been nothing like this before. Stick a sword in them. Doesn't phase them. This is something that, uh, you know, and here's another place where, well, the Bible's just being symbolic. Well, I don't think it is. I think the Bible's saying just what it means. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another text here. And I think here lately, I think I've used this in about every presentation. <laughs> so if you think I'm being redundant, please forgive me. But this text here, the more I study it and the more I look at it and meditate upon it, I think this text here in the book of Jubilees is as important for understanding what's going on in the dark realm as the text in the book of Enoch in chapter 15 and others where it tells us that when the, the Nephilim and the Rapha died, that their spirits are the spirits that are called devils in the New Testament. Now, here's what we need to get. Now, there were these giants on the earth. A giant dies, their disembodied spirit becomes a devil on the earth. But there were some, and this is what I call the Nephilim relocation project of the Father. There were some that were not allowed to be a disembodied spirit on the earth, but they were put right into the bowels of hell. Hmm. 
That's what we're talking about. And we see it right here in the book of Jubilees. And we're going to see a differentiation in hell that these departed Nephilim are not treated like human beings in hell because they have another appointed purpose by the Father. They will be Joel's prophesied army in the last days that will come out. And just like in the book of Joel, the, the Joel's army was connected with the seven prophesied years of famine. The same thing is going to happen right here. It's prophesied to coincide with the darkening of the sun and the moon that Jesus said would take place right before his return. So let's read the text here in the book of Jubilees. And in the third week of this jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah. Now, this is an important point. Who are the children of the sons of Noah? That's Noah's grandkids, aren't, aren't it? And Noah's grandchildren, some of them were Mashish and Tubal, which are going to play big in this whole thing. And this is taking place in the very area where this Gog Magog war is starting to rage right now. And in the and in the third week of this Jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah, and to make to err and destroy them. And the sons of Noah came to Noah with their father, and they told him concerning the demons which were leading astray, and blinding and slaying his sons' sons, that be his grandchildren, went up. And he prayed before the Lord his God and said, God of the spirits of all flesh, who has shown mercy unto me and has saved me and my sons from the waters of the flood and has not caused me to perish as thou didst the sons of perdition. For thy grace has been great towards me and great has been thy mercy to my soul. Let thy grace be lift upon my sons' sons and let not wicked spirits rule over them lest they should destroy them from the earth. Now, this is the result of Noah's prayer. But do thou bless me and my sons, that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And thou knowest how thy watchers, the fathers of these spirits, acted in my day. And as for these spirits which are living, imprison them, and hold them fast in the place of condemnation, and let them not bring destruction to the sons of thy servant, my God. For these are malignant and created in order to destroy. Let them not rule over the spirits of the living, for thou, all, all, for, for thou alone canst exercise dominion over them, and let them not have power over the sons of the righteous from henceforth and forevermore. And the Lord our God bade us to bind all, and the chief of the spirits, Mastema. Now here's where we get the connection that Mastema is Gog, because Gog was the chief prince of Mashish and Tubal, and here we have Masta, Mastema pounding Noah's grandchildren, who were Mashish and Tubal. The dot connects right there. And the chief of the spirits, Mastema, came and said, Lord, creator, let some of them remain before me, and let them hearken to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him, and let nine parts descend in the place of condemnation. Now, this very important text tells us that what we're dealing with right now is the 10%. And things are a bit testy, aren't they, dealing with the 10%. There are 90% that are bound in the underworld. Some of these are disembodied spirits of the giants, some of these are disembodied spirits of half-animal, uh, half-human genetic monsters. And some of these are actually gibberim that were imprisoned in a kind of, uh, well, it, it's kind of just like Night of the Living Dead thing. That's exactly what the Bible is describing, that they live uh, literally as living corpses. Uh, down here in the heart of the earth. And, and the, for people that don't understand the way the world works in, in, a, in a spiritual sense, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. 
these are the things we wrestle against and this is what drives the world that we live in right now and so so these things are really the root of all of them come from this these things am i right it is it's exactly right yeah so it doesn't matter if it's putin or khrushchev or whoever these spirits are going to pull their sway and and have it doesn't matter if it's old uncle joe or you know kamala it doesn't matter the world is driven by these spiritual forces and it's going to play out just like the bible says and uh, the, the Bible says that uh, there's some folks coming up. Now, it's amazing that we are going to actually be able to see, and I call this the roll call of hell. And in the 32nd chapter of Ezekiel, we actually have a peek into the bowels of the earth where it tells us who is going to be coming back. Now, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 32, let's read verses 22 and 23. Asher is there and all her company. His graves are about him, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the sides of the pit, and her company is round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which caused terror in the land of the living. Now, here we see an example of some of these more powerful entities. They were slain with the sword, but they're, they're taken right down. And it's like in their body to continue like as a living corpse. And it says here that they're different. And you can read the 32nd chapter of Ezekiel. There's a different section of Sheol and the abyss where these things are being kept. And it says here that Asher is there. And we've seen Asher. Asher is the same word in the Hebrew that is translated the Assyrian. And we've talked about the Assyrian many times. And we're going to see three groups of people here in the 32nd chapter of Ezekiel that will be given a release. And when we see who these three people are, it is just picture perfect of that which we can anticipate to come, which is already coming. Now, in Ezekiel 31 and 3, behold the Assyrian. Look at the Assyrian. And nobody can see the Assyrian. You know, behold the Assyrian. Well, what are you talking about? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. In verse 8, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. According to the word of God, this entity was in the garden of Eden. The fir trees were not the the fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in beauty. In verse 31, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall the nations of six-day man, when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and the best of Lebanon, all that drink water, shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. Here we see in Ezekiel 31, the Assyrian being thrown into the heart of the earth. Ezekiel 32, it tells about us, him in the heart of the earth as in the roll call of hell that's going to come back. They also went down into hell with him, unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm that dwell under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. Now, the role that Asher played, here's where we really understand why the Assyrian will come back. And there's a lot more text in um, Isaiah 14 and others, Isaiah 10 we could read. But this is the main thing we want to focus on, what did Asher do in the kingdom of darkness in Genesis 10 and 11? And this is right in the text here where it talked about Nimrod being a gibberim. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kalna. Asher was the city builder. And it's all about the cities. It's about the cities being built again as centers of wickedness to put forth the beast kingdom. Now here in Isaiah 23 and 13, who was it 
that built Babylon. Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This people was not till the Assyrian founded it. Right there in the word of God, the Assyrian founded the Chaldean kingdom. For them that dwell in the wilderness, they set up the towers thereof, they raised up the palaces thereof, and he brought it to ruin. The Assyrian is coming back, and once again, this kingdom of Babylon, the final new world order, is going to be constructed. This is the role of the Assyrian. He is the Babylon builder. Hmm. The next is Elam, and that's a name that might not be familiar to a lot of you. We're going to show you just who Elam is. There is Elam, and where we're talking about in the heart of the earth. There is Elam and all her multitude round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down uncircumcised into the nether parts of the earth, which caused their terror in the land of the living, yet have borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. They have set her as a bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though their terror was caused in the land of the living. Yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. He is put in the midst of them that be slain. Now, who is Elam? Let's go back to Brother Daniel Block's commentary, and we'll see the significance of Elam. And it says here, the second on Ezekiel's list is Elam, the ancient nation with its capital of Susa, was situated in the modern Iranian province of Khuzestan. Now, over and over and over, we've talked about the kings of Persia, how the kings of Persia would be stirred. It's in the book of Second Estrus, in the, in the book of Enoch, it's in Daniel 11, that this is where the stirring is going to take place for the final invasion into Israel. Now, where, um, and in Genesis 10 and 22, it's also interesting that Elam is Asher's brother. Mm. Now, in Genesis 10 and 22, in the table of nations, as one of the sons of Shem and the children of Shem, Elam and Asher and our Foxad and Lud and Aram. Now, it's notice when you study Genesis 10, there is Asher of the line of Shem, and before that is the entity Asher. Mm-hmm. Now, the relationship between Asher and the line of Shem and Asher the entity, it's much like the relationship we saw with the, the king of Babylon and Lucifer, the prince of Tyre, the king of Tyre. It's this type of thing going on, that these are actual human beings that lived on the earth, but they were motivated and controlled by this fallen entity. So you can study that. If you read your Bible carefully, you'll see Asher, the entity, and then you'll see Asher from the line of Shem. It's right there in your Bibles. I and, always tell people, to, you know, tell people when they're given names because people are asking about names for their children. I always tell people, like, you know, be careful how you name your ch child. You know, names do matter. They oh really, boy. they really do. Oh, they really, really do. Uh, it is much in a name. Now, the capital of Elam was Susa. And in the Bible, this is called Sushan. Now, this is extremely important for seeing just what's going to happen. The Assyrian, he was the Babylon builder. Now, let's see what happened at Sushan. It says, then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlain, whom he hath appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai, unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. 
And he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Sushan to destroy them. The decree that was given at Sushan to destroy them, to shew it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him for the people. And we know the story of the book of Esther, where Haman uh, plotted to destroy and kill the Jews, and it was at the palace of Sushan. Or this was the capital of Elam. Weird. This is exactly where the plot, and it's right there. Daniel 10, they remained there with the kings of Persia. The book of Enoch, they're going to stir up the kings of Persia. They're going to come into Israel. In Daniel 11, it's in 2nd Estrus, it's in the book of Enoch. This is where the plot is going to be hatched to exterminate Israel. Not only the physical seed, but the spiritual seed. This, once again, is another confirmation that this last day's event invasion is going to be hatched right here in Iran, in Susha. And it's going to go full bore when Elam is released from the underworld. It's so interesting, too. You know, when you're talking about Persia and Iran, obviously Persia and Iran are are the same thing. You know, it's Iran is a Persian word, and... That's believed to be the same thing. And you did that show about Iran, the king of the south. But also, Iran, uh, that comes from the word Aryan, right? They're, the Aryans. It sure and is. so th there's a lot to that, obviously. But well, there's a bunch right there. Yeah. There's a bunch right there. Yeah. Now, we got to throw this in, too. Esther chapter 8, verse 11 through 14. It was at Sushan where the plot was hatched to destroy Israel. And it was at Sushan where this plan was defeated. Mm. Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy and to slay and to cause to perish all the power of the people in the province that would assail, assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day, in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Dar, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all the people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. It's not a bad thing to be ready to fight, is it? And the posts that rode upon the mules and camels went out being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment and the decree was given at Sushan the palace mm. at Sushan the capital of Elam the plot was hatched to destroy the physical seed and the spiritual seed of Israel at Sushan it was defeated this plot that is being hatched and it will go full bore and become a reality when uh, it, it, when the coincides, when Elam comes out of the underworld, just like the spirit, the Nephilim of, uh, of the spirits of Asher, they built Babylon. Here, the role of Elam is destroy Israel. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to happen. Sure as we're sitting here sucking air down our lungs, Iran is going to move into Israel. It's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it will happen. Yep. Now, there's a third. We've got the Assyrian coming back out of the nether parts. We've got uh, Elam, and here's the third. There is Mashish, Tubal, and all her multitude. This is Noah's grandchildren, and this is kind of a sad thing that uh, it doesn't like look like Mashish and Tubal held the fort. It looks like they went they went south. Yeah. There is Mashish, Tubal, and all her multitude. Her graves are round about him. All of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they cause their terror in the land of the living. And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell. Now notice here there's a distinction made. There's a distinction made between these and other people that have died. There's a different place in hell because they're not human. They're not human. Uh part human at best, and they have a future role in the judgment of God. They're Joel's army, and Joel's army, they're down in hell right now waiting. 
and they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war, and they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities shall be upon their bones, though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yea, thou shalt be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised, and shalt lie with them that are slain with the sword. And this we know in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1 and 2. These are Noah's grandchildren. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshish and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now we've got three things here. We've got the land of Magog. And just like John showed, amazingly, I'd never seen that before, mm -hmm. of the Russians wanting to bring back the Scythian army. You look at Josephus. He says, Magog, they're the Scythians, right there by the Black Sea, there by the Caucasus Mountains, right by where this war is going on. And we've got the land of Magog. We've got Gog, who is the chief prince. We're talking about a principality, Prince of Persia, Prince of Grisha, Gog, mm -hmm. the prince of Meshish and Tubal of this land area. And then we've got Meshish and Tubal. Well, they're Noah's grandchildren. Yeah. And we read the text in the book of Jubilees where it was the grandchildren of Noah that were being pounded in this very area. And Noah interceded for God and the word in the book of Jubilees, 90% were put under. But there is a time very soon, and we see it prophesied in the book of Joel where this army will be upon the mountains of Israel. They are the passengers. They are the abar that will pass over, the ones that are seen in Isaiah chapter 13, coming through the gates, they're, they're going to come. And they're going to come as the instruments of God. And uh, how close, I believe, we are out of that. Now, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, let's just read this for clarification. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were born sons after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshish, and Tyrus. Meshish and Tubal were Noah's grandchildren. These are the ones that were being pounded in the book of Jubilees when Noah interceded. And here we can connect the dots that Mastema in Jubilees 10, it's Gog in Ezekiel 38. And it really helps to get this thing sorted. Now, one final thing we're going to look at here, and we've looked at this before, and this is a map from uh, 1878 Bible Commentary by William Jinks that I have. And right here, we see the Black Sea. This is right where this r war is raging, right where we have the Sea of Mariupol, the Siege of Mariupol, of uh, Odessa there. And the whole thing, it's happening right there. We all know that. And look right here. We've got Gomer. We've got Mashish. We've got Tubal. It's all right here. We've got the Scythians right there by Gomer, too. Yeah, yeah the huh? Scythians. It's all right here. It's all right here. It's right here on this map. And people have been dumbed down so much that uh, they don't get these connections. But it's amazing. Right here. This is uh, in an 1878 Bible encyclopedia in the map. It's all right there. And it's happening, and it's happening there right now, and we know it's happening. You know, I'm talking to the choir here. I know. But it's time to blow the trumpet in Zion, to sound the alarm on the holy mountain. It's time for God's people to wake up and get ready and prepare themselves and gird their loins because you, you can see historically— all the way back to Egypt, this famine was used by God to elevate Joseph with the wisdom to prepare. Amen. And Joseph was, they, they come out of Egypt, the children of Israel came out from there back into the promised land. Yep. And it was because of this famine. Yep. And the famine was an instrument of judgment by God upon the wicked. And for those that are the true Israel of God, God is going to bring us through with tremendous victory and deliverance and enable us to speak truth to many, many people. It's time to blow the trumpet in Zion. Amen, David. What an awesome, 
awesome show. A lot of stuff to really for you guys to to chew on and think about and see how it all kind of takes place. I mean, when you look at the world that we're living in today, guys, mm -hmm. um, some of these things might sound wild, like, oh, man, these guys were talking about people coming back from the dead. What's yeah. going on? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> but it is exactly what we're talking about. And this is exactly what, you know, you hear about in the predictive programming. This is what science is talking about, you know, bringing people to an infinite mind where they can be inside of a, uh, hard drive basically you know inside of a cloud and, and live forever and you have all these weird things going on in the world so it's not that far-fetched i know a lot of people don't really know what's going on in the world because they're so focused on whatever the fake news company and i hate to even use that word because i know trump coined that word but i mean that's a great word to describe it it's it's fake news it's stuff to it's stuff for you to be distracted it all is it's all that it's all that stuff is it always has been always will be and unfortunately, people are so worried about um, Ukrainians or so worried about whatever, whatever's on the top story of the news for the day, whatever that is, that they can't see what's really going on. And this is why we do the shows that we do is so you can see what's really going on versus what we see uh, in the world being told to us that's going on. There's such a different difference there. There's a disconnect there, but there's also connections there too. And the Bible is the only way to do it. So David, with that being said, thanks so much for bringing the scriptures to life, bringing it to current day and bringing it to, um, the world. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of people listening, there's going to be thousands of people that see this broadcast before it's all said and done. And we just pray for each and every one of you guys that you can see the truth that the that the father will peel the blindness off of your eyes because that's what he had to do for us all it, there was no there's no redemption without him redeeming us there's no forgiveness without his grace and love there's nothing we can do on our own to deserve it nor uh receive it other than the fact that he gives it to us and we're just going to pray that each person that happens to stumble across our show by by circumstance which i don't believe in all that but i believe that you know, you could be watching anything, but you're here. So there's a reason that you're here watching it. And I really believe that God's opening eyes. And I hope that everyone watching, their eyes are open. That would be amazing. And, you know, people always say, well, what do we do? Well, number one, uh, if you have not repented and turned from your sin, do so immediately. And throw yourself upon the grace and mercy of the cross. We will not fail you for salvation, a new birth in Christ. Uh, number two, get out of the cities where Joel's army shows up. Number three, do what you can to prepare yourself physically. And number four, keep your spiritual life red hot in a daily communion and a relationship with Jesus. And uh, just be red hot for Jesus. You know, Keith Green, the old musician, he said, my definition of a Christian is someone that's bananas for Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just be bananas for Jesus, and yes. uh, you'll be fine. You can't go wrong with that, you know. Um, there's, I'm sure you've heard David about the uh, like 18 food processing plants that have been destroyed or yeah. burnt or planes crashed into two of them. Yeah, um, you know, and and we always want to blame it on somebody particular, but this could be the work of God, right? This could it be could. literally be the work of God doing this on purpose. Yeah. bringing these planes down, whatever the case may be. But we know that uh, these things are coming and it will be the hand of God that brings it. We can't, you know, we can't deny that. Every verse you read yeah. said that they're fulfilling God's will. The giants are coming to fulfill yeah. his wrath. They're, you know, they're yeah. his army. And uh, so we need to be aware of that and prepare for it. We know it's coming, so let's, let's prepare for yeah. it. And these 19 incidences, they could very well have been supernaturally instigated. Yes very easily so yeah i mean, I mean it, we we there's so many things we've got the uh there we're not going to have a wheat crop out of ukraine the russian holding back the fertilizer uh tons of uh produce rotting in israeli warehouses israeli farmers going bankrupt we, we just go on and on and on and you all know you you're all uh know these things are happening we just need to just just be in the lord right now i mean we've just got to every day we have to be ready 
to live and die for Jesus if necessary. We've just got to blow the trumpet in Zion. We've got to sound the alarm and do everything we can to show this delusion to people so that they can come into the true kingdom of God and get themselves out of this kingdom of darkness. Yeah, there's a better option than standing in the street with a we stand you from you with Ukraine sign <laughs> holding a Starbucks coffee. There's better <laughs> options out there. Yeah. You don't have to do that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we do. Our, our heart goes out. We know there's believers that are suffering in that war zone. Yeah, and we don't make light of that. But there's that. That's just a no hope broadcast with uh, Zelensky and Soros and their Nazi military divisions, the whole thing. But uh, our heart does indeed. There, there, There's Ukrainian people that are as innocent in this as many Americans that and, are just being manipulated by this beast government. So Russians too. I mean, oh, there's yeah, people manipulated people everywhere. Also, yeah. yeah, and the Russian people, for the most part, uh, they're a good-hearted, hearty uh, people. They're not, uh, you know, they're not like the people that are running the show just like here in America but we just want to encourage each and every one of you to seek the Lord with all of your heart be obedient to God because these are the days that are prophesied when uh, God's remnant are going to stand up and the glory of God is going to shine on his people and we will be doing some awesome things not because we're awesome but because the father's awesome Yes. And we just ask for you guys to to do your part, share this broadcast, uh, share the truth with everybody you've come in contact with, because the time is running short. We believe that. And you don't know how long you got. You may not have more than a day or two to live. You don't know that. None of us do. So what we're going to do right now is called the Pounder's Pound. That's where you pound the like button. And I was just thinking, you know, all those rumblings that we've been hearing around in southern <laughs> Indiana. Adam said, is it because of the Pounder's Pound? <laughs> well, hey. Yeah, hey, it might be the Pounder's Pound causing all these rattlings in southern Indiana. So let's try it again. Let's see if it happens. We could so. be shaking up Joel's army in the heart of the earth. Yeah, well, I know we are. We, <laughs> we really are. are. All right, guys, here we go. On the count of three, we're going to pound that like button. One, David, two, three. three. Boom. Boom. Hit it. There we you. go. Thank you guys so much. And hit subscribe if you haven't already. David, in this out. It is just with thankfulness from the bottom of our heart to all our Midnight Ride listeners that we just thank you so much for having a heart for the Father and having a heart for us to enable us to do what we do. Thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. And with our heartfelt thankfulness to all of you, high five and good night, everybody. Till next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central on the Midnight Ride. High five and good night, everybody. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.